Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about how to write and solve differential equations for drag forces. This is primarily for AP Physics C students, and I'm going to start from the beginning and show you in a very straightforward way how to think through these problems and what exactly we're dealing with. So our objectives for today are going to be to go over what a differential equation is, show how to solve for a velocity equation using the drag force, and highlight key strategies to keep in mind during the process. And a type of problem you would see on an FRQ for AP Physics C mechanics would be to solve for the velocity function for an object experiencing a drag force of BV or KV or negative BV or negative KV. So I'll talk you through what that means in just a minute. But first I do want you to conceptually think about what's going on in the image here and conceptually think about the forces that are involved when someone goes skydiving. When someone jumps out of a plane, their force, primary force in the y-axis, is going to be the force due to gravity. We're going to ignore the x-axis for now. And as time passes, they fall faster and faster. But as they fall, that drag force is going to push against them in a greater and greater sense. It's a resistive force. It's like the force due to air resistance, such that after a while, those two forces will balance each other. That means they will have reached terminal velocity. These folks will not get any faster unless they tuck their arms in, for instance. All right, so one of the first things you're going to need to know how to do is to be able to solve for what that terminal velocity would be or to demonstrate what that would be. And what I like to do is what's called the sum of the forces strategy, just a very systematic way of thinking about forces. The first thing you're going to do is add up all the forces in the axis that you're working with. In this case, we're going to make down positive because that's how it's typically done, but also I think it more intuitively makes sense personally. Now, if you want to do this in the opposite direction, that's fine, but don't feel like you have to always make up positive and down negative just because you've seen that for years and years in math classes. Most of the time these problems are done, it's assumed that down, in this case, it's going to be positive, like the forward direction can be treated as positive and the backwards direction is negative. So we're going to call this force due to gravity or mg minus bv. And then the second line for the sum of the forces strategy is going to be Newton's second law right here. Sum of the forces is equal to ma, which at terminal velocity, this acceleration of the y is going to be zero. So we can go ahead and set these equal to each other and see what happens. What happens is it turns out that the force due to gravity is equal to bvt. And if we isolate for vt, we end up with mg over b. So you will probably need this. If you see this on an FRQ, you will need to know how to solve for that terminal velocity quickly and efficiently. And you may even need to come back to the problem and like take this and insert it in your problem as you work the problem. In some FRQs, you may be expected to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and go back to the question, though. The question would be solve for the velocity function for an object experiencing a drag force of BV. All right, now this is in a more general sense. We're not talking about terminal velocity here. We're talking about any speed, like what, what would be our velocity function. So we're going to set up the sum of the forces strategy again in the y-axis. We set these equal to each other. And if you take a look at this equation, at this point, we actually have three constants here. We've got m, g, and b, so we're not that focused on them, but we do want to pay special attention to v and a. Both of those are important unknowns, and so because we have two unknowns, it's always preferable to reduce two unknowns to one, if at all possible. So any ideas about how we could do that in thinking about velocity and acceleration? Well, what we would do is take the derivative of velocity, and that would be the acceleration. So let's go ahead and sub in for a, we're going to sub in dv over dt, and that would reduce two unknowns to one. And I just want to take a minute to say, this is what a differential equation is. I think it's actually a really cool concept, the idea that you have a variable, in this case v, as well as its derivative in the same equation. And this is how we can keep track of, like, all right, how does the velocity change with respect to other factors affecting the velocity? So I just, I think it's an interesting idea, but that is literally what we mean by a differential equation. All right, next up, our key strategy is we need to separate out all of the V's on one side of the equation and all of the T's on another side of the equation. That's actually not easy to do here. So we're going to talk through how to do this. The strategy is going to be called separate, separate, integrate, integrate. So let's think about how this works. First of all, you're going to want to get rid of this m value. You want to get rid of this m value because we want to get dv and dt as much by themselves as possible. 
So the way we do that is actually we're going to divide every term in this equation by m. And if we do that, we end up with g minus bv over m is equal to dv over dt. Next, I'm going to show something that will be a little bit messy, but we want to get v's on the right-hand side in this case, and we want to get the t's over to the left-hand side. The t's will be easy to move over to the left. Let's go ahead and figure out how would we get this entire thing over to the right-hand side. Well, one way we could do this is just divide both sides of the equation by that g minus bv over m value. If we did this, this whole thing over here would reduce to 1, and notice we would have v on the right-hand side with this other v right here, dv, I should say. And then it would be relatively easy to get rid of the dt. We just multiply both sides by dt. So let me show you how this looks. First of all, we're going to cancel this out to 1. And so we end up with 1. And then if I multiply dt on both sides to cancel out this dt and this dt over here, we end up with this equation right here, dt is equal to dv over g minus bv over m. All right, so notice we've achieved a huge accomplishment here in the sense that we've got our v's on one side of the equation and our t on the other side of the equation. So I'm going to go ahead and take this equation, and it is right here so you can see the work that we've done so far. And I do want to take a moment to say down below we're going to multiply by an m over m to the g value. We can do that to anything that we want, right? We're just effectively multiplying by 1. And if we do that, then we have a denominator under the g which matches what we have on the right side. And then we can continue with our simplification process. And the next thing we can do is just to simplify this. This m is in the denominator of a denominator, so we can just bring it up top here. And now this is pretty well cleaned up up to this point, and we've got our variables separated out, so that's fantastic. What we're going to do next is integrate both sides. So we're effectively following the laws of algebra while using calculus. We're going to integrate both sides, and so it's going to look something like this. Notice that I do want to use my bounds that are appropriate for each of the variable that we're integrating in respect to. And if I take the integral of dt evaluated from 0 to t, that just ends up being t minus 0. On the right-hand side, we have some more complex things to think about. So we'll get to that in a minute. I'm just taking care of the easy side first. And one more thing we could do to simplify this is just bring the m to the left-hand side so that we just have the integral on the right-hand side. And this is where we're left with. I'm going to show that at the beginning of the next slide, right up about here. So there we are. And now we get to something a little more complex because we don't really have the chain rule with integration, but we do have something called u substitution. So what we're going to do is use u substitution where we set u equal to the denominator that we have. And so I'm going to define u as being equal to what's in my denominator here. And then our fifth strategy is going to be to take the derivative of du with respect to dv and solve for dv. Let's see what that would look like. So you take the derivative of both sides with respect to dv, and you end up with 0 for this first term right here, because that's just two constants multiplied by each other. And then the derivative of v, you could say, would be just this negative constant that's out in front. And if we want to solve in terms of dv, because that will be most helpful for us, then we would isolate for dv and we end up with this equation here. So now we followed our fifth key strategy. We're going to take the derivative of du with respect to dv and solve for dv. Now we can sub in this for dv whenever we need to. So then we say, all right, this is where we're at so far. This was our more complex equation where we had this function in the denominator that we needed to set equal to u, which we did. And then we took the derivative of du with respect to dv and solve for dv. Now my question is, what do you think we can do with this? What do you think we can do with these three equations here? All right, well, hopefully you can notice that we could sub in u for this, and we could sub in this value right here for dv, put that in here. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. It turns out that we end up with this. This is a little bit hard to read in the sense that normally we have the du at the ends, and we can pull out this negative b as a constant. So let's go ahead pull out the negative b as a constant and put the du at the end here to make it a little easier to visualize what's going on. And so we say, all right, this is where we're at. 
if we were going to integrate 1 over u with respect to u, then that would end up being the natural log of u evaluated at bounds that are not signified here yet. And that's just essentially a rule of working with integrals and natural logs. One way that you would notice that in your mind, this equation is more or less the opposite of what I just did, and that is on your equation sheet. So if you think about the opposite of that, Let's go ahead and integrate both sides. If we do that over here, the left just basically cancels. This business cancels, and you're left with a natural log of ax is equal to 1 over x. And that's what we have over here. We've got this natural log of u is equal to the integral of 1 over u. So that's how you could justify it, or that's how you could look on the back of your equation sheet and notice that and help you to reason through this. And moving forward, our key strategy number 6 is going to be to sub in values for v. So after you've done this integration, then we've done the integration with the embedded function. Now we can go back and sub that back in in terms of v. So we did the integration in terms of u and we substituted in for u. Now we're ready to go back and put this in terms of v. So that's what we're going to do next. So instead of ln of u, I've got ln of mg minus bv, for instance. I've subbed in what u was equal to. We said u was equal to this. I'm just putting it in here, and we're ready to evaluate. Now we put in our bounds in terms of v values that make sense from 0 to whatever value at v we're looking at. All right, so I'm going to take this equation and show you the same equation on the next page, and we can identify how this plays out. So you end up with evaluating from 0 to v. I'm starting to do that here. And then you would say, well, there's a rule of natural logs where we could simplify this. And it's essentially if you have the natural log of something minus the natural log of something else, you can take these two things and put them in the numerator and a denominator, respectively. That's something that hopefully you can spot or become familiar enough with to spot. That can take some practice, but you are going to need to be able to do that, most likely. If you want all of the points in your test, you'll need to be able to know that. All right, so what are we going to do next? So let's remind ourselves, remember, we're trying to get v by itself. We don't want the natural log and then this embedded equation over here. We want to get rid of that natural log and get v by itself eventually. So how do we get rid of a natural log function? All right, well, what you can do is you can take everything and set it as a power to the e value. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So this, you take both sides of the equation and you put it to the power of e. And what that does is these will effectively cancel each other out. So that's what we're going to be left with over here is this. And notice we have now gotten rid of that natural log function. And that's going to be our seventh key strategy here. And then we can say, well, let's go ahead and continue to simplify. Again, we want to get v by itself. So next is just algebra. Bring this mg over to this side right here. And then we're going to say, all right, we're going to take that. Let's subtract over the mg because we want to get v by itself. And then you want to take care of the negative v and get v by itself over here. So the negative goes here and the v goes down below here. That negative gets distributed in and you end up with this function for your velocity. And that is effectively your answer. You get a function as an answer. All right, now what does this all mean and how could we visualize this? That's what I want to ask next. So you may be asked to draw like conceptual or qualitative graphs for velocity time, acceleration time, and position time. And so let's go ahead and start with velocity, then we'll work our way down to acceleration, then we'll go up to position, and I'll get rid of this. This is just a reminder of what our answer was for the function. All right, now with time, I want you to think to yourself, what happens? This is an object that drops out of an airplane. With time, what would the velocity do? And take a moment to really think about this. Take like five seconds to pause and think about what would this graph look like. All right, so over time, what it's going to look like is this. It has the greatest acceleration, so to speak, in the beginning. And then that acceleration levels off to almost zero and basically does level off to zero as the velocity approaches this terminal velocity as an asymptote. And remember, I'm doing this in the sense that down is positive, so that's why it looks like this. If you did the opposite, assuming down was negative for this, you're on the right track. You just have to remember that we're treating down as positive here. All right, next up, how would you go from this graph to this graph down here? It's worth thinking about. It's worth pausing for like five seconds to see if you can reason through this. What do you think? 
All right, well, remember when you go from velocity versus time graphs to acceleration versus time graphs, you will take the derivative of that. And on a graph, that's going to be looking at the instantaneous slope for a tangent line. So then you would say, well, let's take tangent lines and just visually and conceptually think about what that would be. This slope would be the greatest. This slope would be lesser. And as time goes on, that slope, that a value, approaches zero. So what would this graph look like? Well, it would look like this, where you're going to have the greatest slope, so therefore the greatest acceleration at an early point in the fall. And then that acceleration is going to level off, and eventually it's going to be zero as time approaches infinity. Well, let's think about the last graph that we have yet to talk about. What is going to happen here? What do you think the position versus time graph is going to look like? Well, let me show you what it looks like. First of all, you do have a quick drop. So you have an acceleration that is greatest in the beginning, and then it sort of levels off. Why is that? Well, because our velocity is going to be constant during that later time, and that means that this slope is not going to be changing during that later time. So this is effectively what the graph should look like, something like that in a conceptual or a qualitative way. In any case, hopefully this whole thing has been helpful. If you have any comments or questions down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.